first, I want to congratulate you on completing the trilogy. Um, I've had the privilege of listening to them all as they came out. Um, I've heard the new album as well. And then yesterday I sat down and listened to all three, one after the other, which was, which was such a great experience. So knowing that you created this trilogy, you know, did you have the repertoire for all three of them selected as you started it, or did that evolve as each album was in the process of being recorded? Uh, no, it definitely evolved. Um, I think the first album, A Character of Quiet, uh, that music on that album just really felt like the music that was relevant for me to play at that moment in time, which was in June of 2020. Um, then Richard Daniel Poor um, approached me about writing an American mosaic for me to play uh, in this, like shortly before I recorded that, he approached me about that. And so that, that evolved. And um, the third album, Undersong, came out of a at home recital that I was doing for Music Worcester, which is this uh, fabulous organization in Worcester, Massachusetts. And so I um, created an album. I, I actually recorded the concert for Music Worcester and the concert for the Oregon Bach Festival, which was the virtual premiere of An American Mosaic. I recorded all of that in one week. And um, so essentially made two albums in one week. <laughs> and that was in November of 2020. It's interesting because if you, if you go back and look at the reviews for the first album, a lot of critics were saying, this is exactly the tonic we need at this time because of, you know, we're in the early stages of the pandemic. You know, it felt like everything had slowed down and this combination of music that you had chosen really struck a nerve with a lot of people. And I'm wondering, what recording these pieces of music and performing them did for you? How did it help you get through that early phase of the pandemic? It was really, um, it was essential for me because um, uh, in March and April, and yeah, I would say March and April, I really came to a standstill, March and April of 2020. And I didn't feel that I could really, I didn't want to practice and I didn't want to play and I didn't want to listen to music. And um, it was a very strange experience for me to be so disassociated from the language that I have used since I was a child. <laughs> um, and so making these albums uh, was, a great focus for me and also um, it both drew me in in terms of engaging me with with my work but also it felt therapeutic because um, I was able to process different things that I was feeling through the music which I, I had lost that when I when I had stopped playing. Yeah, I found it interesting. I saw an interview that you did or read the text of an interview that you did with NPR and you talked about how you weren't practicing at all. Um, and then your producer said, well, let's just record, which I think most people would say, well, you don't record if you haven't been practicing because of the, activity <laughs> and the time associated with recording. Has your relationship with, with the piano changed during this time? Yes, I think that, I think my relationship has definitely changed with um, the role of music in my life. Um, I think <clears throat> it's hard getting back into um, the real world. I mean, not that we're totally back right now, but I have had a crazy fall of performing. But before this started and, you know, before the fall began, um, I think that this period of time at home that I had um, and just working for the recordings and just for myself mainly um, made me realize that, um, I mean, I think a lot of people have realized this, that time is, time. our time here is finite and it, um, 
it doesn't make sense to do things that don't feel meaningful or that make us unhappy. And um, of course, every life has, has to have some of that, you know, there's some drudgery and there's some things that you don't want, you don't want to do. But in general, um, as a musician, it's really hard because you tend to, you know, you're essentially I'm a freelancer. And so I take everything that comes. And uh, I just felt that I became much more in touch with the kind of music that I wanted to play, the kind of playing I want to do, and the kinds of projects that I find really engaging. I think I'm speaking for myself and for a number of people that I know, I think during this time, music and the arts have become essential. In fact, one of my big rallying points at this point is the pandemic proved that the performing arts is, you know, the, and the people involved in the part are essential workers. As where would we be during this time if we didn't have music to go to, if we didn't have the arts to see, even if it was streaming or a Zoom reading of a play or, or whatever it is. Did you seek out other expressions of art beyond your own during this time? Well, strangely, it was the first time in, in quite a long time that I started actually sitting down and listening to music at home. Because I think I felt quite burnt out when I was traveling on the road and all these years of just busting a gut. And so my husband and I invested in a really wonderful LP player and new speakers and we started collecting some vinyl. And um, it's a very different form of listening to sit down and listen to a record. And so we started like literally, you know, having an evening where we would just sit down and listen to a whole record. And, um, and that was really just, it, it was amazing because I haven't listened to music like that at home and since I was, you know, in my early twenties, I would say. Um, and then the other thing that I did was uh, with my parents, my husband and my parents and some good friends of ours um, kind of had a sort of uh, informal um, movie theater Zoom group. And we would, we would meet like twice a month on Zoom and we would each suggest a play or a movie that we were gonna watch and we would then discuss it. And um, that was fantastic because I, I do love, I love cinema. And um, so you're watching a lot of older movies and movies from other countries and, and just having the opportunity to actually talk about it. Like I never have had time to do this kind of thing. So that was, that was great. And then I also started reading poetry, which I, have not done very much of at all. And um, uh, yeah, so these were kind of departures for me. You know, you mentioned movies and, and on Undersong, um, I think it's fair to say that the album is anchored by Chrysleriana by Schumann, um, which is a piece that has been used in, in any number of movies um, itself. He, Schumann wrote that piece, you know, as, and dedicated it to Clara. Um, and I'm wondering what this romantic piece says to you and says to us, or you would like it to say to us as we come out of the pandemic, since that is, I think, the centerpiece of, of the new album. Uh... I mean, Chrysleriana has been a very important piece for me for many years, um, since I was in my early 20s. Um, and I think that the music is so complicated because it has a, it has a romantic impassioned element to it, which you can hear you know, he apparently wrote it in four days for Clara, um, though it's formally dedicated to Chopin, actually, but, but he personally dedicated it to Clara. Um, so it has this kind of romantic expression, which is um, something that we can identify. 
but also there's something about it that's truly modern um, and strange. Rhythmically, uh, the use of meter, just the sort of displacements of beats. Um, there's a feeling about it that is not quite settled in its time. Um, and also quite influenced by Bach too. There's, there's so much counterpoint in it. And all of the music in Chrysleriana has a tendency to kind of circle in on itself. Um, there's, there's a lot of introspection that and quick changes from something very, very uh, agitated to something very still and, and looking into oneself. Um, I think that all of those qualities are very reflective of the time that, we, that we're in right now because we do feel kind of unsettled and not grounded. And um, there's been a very strange feeling about time and um, many people talked about feeling like they were in, in an endless loop um, and feeling like things are getting better and then things are getting worse. And uh, it's just very, very up and down. And um, I think that Price Sariana really is such an amazing piece of music and, and just, I, I feel like it resonates right now. Yeah, I think it does. I also think Mad Rush does as well. And, yeah. and I, you know, I, I've been a big fan of Bella Classes for a long time. And I, I, I went this morning and, and played his performance of that track and then played yours. And they're distinctly different beats. Um, and I'm wondering what latitude you think a performer should have to perform a piece differently than the composer himself actually performed. I think that Philip Glass would be the first person to say that it's the music comes to life in the performance by the performer. And uh, he certainly grants that freedom to people that interpret his music. I think partially because he himself is a performer. So he knows how much changes in the act of performance. Um, I feel that, <clears throat> I, I don't feel that composers have ownership of their music. You know, I think that I'm the daughter of a painter, of an artist, and um, having grown up with somebody who is creating works from nothingness, right? So, you know, if you're an artist or a composer, you're, you're going from nothing to a creation, whereas I'm going from something, a text of some sort, and, and then recreating it in, in, in my own way. Um, but if you're going from nothing to creation, I think that there's a lot about that process that is mysterious. And I don't think that the artist or the visual artist or the composer necessarily understands everything that went into the music that they wrote or painted. Um, I think that really great music has a lot in it and a lot of different directions it can go in. And um, it's the role of the interpreter to look into that music and try to make sense out of it and have it, have it create a form with it, you know? And um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe what I'm saying is somewhat uh, some kind of heresy, but, uh, but I think that um, it's much, I, I don't understand when people think that composers know exactly how their music should be played. And, and frankly, if I was to hear a composer say that their music should be played exactly in one way, I feel like that's incredibly limiting to their own work. Well, it's interesting because you said that you don't think composers often know exactly what it is that they've done. And, and as you said that, I'm thinking, if Schumann wrote Chrysleriana in four days, how could he possibly understand what he did? Yes, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that having read writing of his, he had very strong opinions about how his music should be played. 
um, and I'm sure that there are many composers that do have very strong opinions about it. But playing Christ Ariana in 2022 is a completely different kettle of fish than, than playing it, you know, and uh, when did he write it? 1838, I think. Um, so, and even if, if I was playing a piece of music that somebody wrote just the other day, like uh, Richard Daniel Borg, say, you know, which he, the piece he wrote for me at, uh, almost a year ago, um, he may have a very strong idea about how it should be played, but it could work in other ways too. And maybe he wouldn't consider it his approved version, but it still is music that exists and that can exist. It, it, the music doesn't exist on the page. I mean, it's, it's nothing without coming to life, in my opinion, in, in orally, you have to hear it in real life. And, um, and somebody has to interpret it and, and we're all different. And if, if it only could have one interpretation, then, then just have the composer make one recording of it and, that, and then we're done with it. <laughs> Well, between you and me, as long as as long as you've committed what could potentially be deemed an act of heresy, I will as well. I think your performance of Mad Rush is infinitely more moving than Philip Glass's. It touched me in a way that that piece hadn't touched me before. I was really profoundly moved. Oh, well, thank you. But I mean, I I find his. I don't know that. I actually don't think I've heard his 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 recording of it. I've watched him play it live. Um, which I found very, very interesting um, because his playing is so much freer than most people play his music. Um, and, you know, he, he, he would say that he's not, he's not primarily a pianist, right? So um, what he's doing in his playing, I feel is more showing us shapes and showing us intentions um, which is really fascinating. And, um, but uh, I think that piece is so, um, it's, it, 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 it's hard to put your finger on it, but I think that basically it's a piece that's about being alone, which is interesting because it's called Mad Rush. Um, but I feel that there's a great deal of solitude in the piece and, um, and so that's really interesting to try to explore as a pianist. It's interesting because you were, you were interviewed by BBC Music Magazine, I believe it was last year, for their Music That Changed Me series. Um, and you said, my touch is more legato, and that's how I feel music. It took a long time for me to accept that. What changed for you in terms of your playing and your priorities once that acceptance set in? Uh, well, I, I, I guess I've, I've embraced it much more, you know, like I, I've thought about it. As you get older, you kind of have to live with who you are. I mean, things might change a bit, but basically we are who we are. And um, as a young pianist, I was trying to explore lots of different types of persona, you know, and um, realizing that actually I really think of playing the piano as singing and um, that, that breath, breathing, singing, legato, legato is how people sing, you know, and, um, and I just basically don't hear music as something that I couldn't sing. Um, and so while I really admire pianists who can play in a way that is completely unsung and sounds like a, like a completely different kind of instrument, it doesn't seem to be something that I'm good at doing or really that feels very natural to me. Um, and so I'm just trying to now have more confidence in, in playing how I, how I feel it to be and what suits my playing. Um, choosing the music that suits that too, but stretching myself. I mean, uh, this past year, another huge project that I did was um, creating a, 
a, a kind of performance devised piece using um, Charles Ives' Concord Sonata. And um, that was really an amazing to learn because that piece is often played in quite a almost brutal way. And um, I did not like that with the music. I didn't want to play it like that. And, um, and so finding how to, finding what I think is, uh, you know, vibrant and, and where the music speaks and showing that in my, in how I play um, was a real challenge with Ives. Yeah, I mean, I think Ives is a really fascinating composer and particularly to, to hear how different people interpret it um, because it's, it's, it's truly idiosyncratic music. Very. Um, you know, in the, in the New York Times in 2007 described you as someone who has made your, quote, made her career by breaking every rule of the book. Um, do you agree with, with that assessment from 14 and a half years ago? And do you think that's an accurate reflection of, of how you approach your career today? I think at that time, um, what I was doing was quite different than what, in terms of how I built my career, it was quite different in that there was a lot that had to do with how I just carved out a path for myself without having won any international competitions or the fact that I was, you know, uh, I think I, I was already in my 30s and um, a mother and, you know, I mean, there were so many things about what I was doing then that were different um, and how I, cre how I recorded my, my first album of the Goldbergs, which was really done in, at that time, a very indie way. Um, I think now, when I look at young people, um, people that were the age I was then or, or younger, I think that many of them are doing really interesting and offbeat things. And, um, and I think there are quite a lot of musicians who have realized that you have to find a new road that we can't keep on doing the same path. It's not just not working and it's not speaking to people. Um, so I don't know if I'm so unique anymore. <laughs> um, one thing this pandemic has, has prompted a lot of people to do is be very introspective and to think about what their priorities are as they move forward. As you move forward, you know, into the, whatever the next phase of your career is going to be after this trilogy. Have you come up with any thoughts or any ideas as to what you want to do moving forward and the statement you want to make as an artist? Yeah, I mean, I have, I have dreams. Uh, I, I like creating creating works and, um, and having more ownership. So um, there are a few things that really interest me. I have this ensemble, a kind of un unofficial ensemble that I created called Baroquelin, um, with whom I've done uh, several Bach, Bach concerto concerts where I lead them from the keyboard. And increasingly I have been leading chamber orchestras from the keyboard when I play concertos. Uh, and I really love the experience of leading. I think that's that's really interesting to be able to directly talk to musicians in an orchestra and get them to try to to interpret the music in the same way that I am for for the music that we're playing. Um, but I really like the idea of having my own ensemble, which could be more um, you know more permanent and do more repertoire, not just Bach. Um, I also, this piece that I did with the Ives was, um, was using lots of different um, parts of my brain that I had never used before. So I was actually acting as like a director and um, working with a video artist and a lighting designer and, um, and thinking very visually. So it was really that I was not just thinking about playing, but I was thinking about how, what we see 
integrates with what we hear and telling a story that way, that was really exciting. And I'd love to do more of that kind of thing. Um, so not handing it over to someone else to, to, to figure out, but actually being part of the creative process from the beginning. I want to finish our, our time together by asking you about something that Philip Glass wrote in his memoir, Words Without Music. And he said, one of Allen Ginsberg's t-shirts said, well, while I'm here, I'll do the work. And what's the work? To ease the pain of living. Everything else, drunken dumb show. Um, how does music ease the pain of living for you? And by extension, how would you like this trilogy to help ease the pain of the world in which we live in today? Oh, that's a heavy question. <laughs> um, finish big. You know, you're an artist. You know. You to... <laughs> uh, uh, I think I get a lot of really beautiful emails from people who have listened to my recordings and have had different kinds of profound responses to them or, or life events that have taken place around them. I mean, really important things. And um, it, I think that the music on these three albums uh, is music that I hope will, will make the listeners more reflective and um, create a, a kind of, I was not gonna say framework, but I don't even think framework is the right word. It is, um, a filter through which to see the world. You know, I think that's what really great art does and all of the music on these albums is just like the best music. Um, and I, I hope that um, that it will give people that kind of reflection and and peace and understanding. Well, I have to say it was really a gift yesterday to listen to all three albums one after the other. Uh, it was, Thank you. I just really felt like I was on an emotional journey through all of it, um, but I didn't leave not having optimism. I still left being optimistic about what's in front of us. That's so great. I, I, I'm really touched. Um, I, I haven't listened to all three albums in a row, but now I want to. <laughs> sounds like you need to get them all on vinyl so you can listen to them that way. Because it's, I know. Isn't it much better to take the needle off the record than to hit a space bar to stop hearing something? Definitely, definitely. Well, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk to me, Simona. Um, are you all right with my posting this video on our, on our YouTube channel? Sure, yeah, that'd be great. But I will make sure that that um, the link is, is sent off to Christina and that you'll know when the piece runs and also you know when the videos run as well. It should be within a day of each other. Thank you. Thanks for the very thoughtful questions. My pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy okay. the